Welcome to our town. Well, election day has finally come and left. And personally, I am extremely glad not to hear any more political rhetoric, any more negative campaigning and mudslinging. And from the results, we have another look at the profile or the character and personality of our town. We decided that uh, we would rather have had Bush than Clinton by around 700 and, excuse me, 900 votes. So I guess that would say, or some people would say, that means that we're uh, more conservative. And we didn't really think things were all that bad. Sixty of us thought that Perot should have been president. Um, the treadmill to the floor, or whatever it was he said, uh, those over 2,000 people preferred Perot to the chicken man or the potato chip man, as Perot would say. We decided we didn't want women in the U.S. Congress, or in the Senate, I should say. Hurchison and Seymour uh, we're carried by wide margins over Boxer and Feinstein. Does that mean we're not ready for women in political office? Uh, there's no woman on the city council yet, and no woman holds any significant positions. Or is it just we're looking at the individuals and decided that Seymour and Hutchison were By only 170 votes, we denied the governor the constitutional power to reduce expenditures on welfare. Well, at least our city. Right now, you're important. <laughs> Have you been to City Hall? And seeing all of the maps and historic kinds of, uh, oh, what, the old uh, chart for the uh, timetable for Lordsburg train station it used to be in the city hall. And, uh, and recently, some maps of this region, when it was Lordsburg, the very early part of the history before Lords Lordsburg, were donated uh, to the city. And Evelyn Hollinger is uh, going to give us a look at those maps. But we do have a remarkable collection of uh, maps and um, things that were collected by a man by the name of Lee Swenson, who moved here about uh, 13 years ago. And at that time, I was doing welcoming work, um, you might say orientation work, for the city and for the Chamber of Commerce. And he told me that he was going to be in competition with me for collecting artifacts. So here about, um, oh, six weeks ago, perhaps, he called me and said that where he lives has been bought by Caltrans and he has to move and he wanted some of these things to remain in Laverne, but he couldn't afford to give them to us. So I alerted um, uh, our Historical Society President and Vice President, Galen Beery and Don Kendrick, and then um, also the city hall and the, the mayor and the city manager and different people went and looked at his collection and we would have liked to have bought all of it, but um, it was too expensive for us. For one thing, he had a whole collection of all Laverne's box labels except one and they're all properly um, framed and um, in picture frames and, and also in acid proof um, paper. So we did buy some of the things, and we're very happy to have them. So uh, maybe we can look at them now. Okay, let's do that. Okay. And this is perhaps the, the most significant 
of all the things that uh, the Historical Society and Solve and the city went together to buy. It is apparently uh, a map, it looks like it's the map of the very first plat that I.W. Lord used in uh, selling the um, uh, lots, or they tried to sell the lots. They had a big sale on, on May 25th, 1887, where they, sold, they had thousands of people come and they sold a lot of these lots. This, uh, Mr. Swenson told me that he found all this just in a shoebox someplace and that he took it to a, a qualified person who mounted it and put it together. So there are some holes in it, but it shows every lot and the numbers and, and everything on here and where the, the Santa Fe Railroad, and they called it the San, Ber San Bernardino Los Angeles Way Railway then. And you see that, that uh, it goes south uh, from, uh, it was called Palomar's. Palomar's is now Arrow Highway. And this is called Laverne Road. It was called Pomona Avenue then. It was originally called Mud Springs Road, actually. There were a lot of things. Now you'll notice it's an odd shape. And the reason for that being because this already belonged to the heirs of the Behar family and, the, and those people. And up here was Mrs. Mill's property, and she didn't want to part with any of that until 1910, and it went all the way to Foothill Boulevard. So this was the original map. Now, when they incorporated, they didn't go below here. This is what's called um, Orange Avenue, and this is Walnut now. And then it went really just beyond, see, this is, um, this is B Street and this is C Street, so it didn't go quite all the way. No, I mean this is C. This is C Street, B A Street, and it didn't go much beyond uh, A Street. And then it had a kind of an odd shape up here, because this part in here belonged to somebody else. Okay. But it's remarkable. Yeah. It's remarkable. Now, uh, for this news story, could we go quickly through the other items, yeah, and then yeah. we'll come back yeah, here yeah. to do these in detail. And this is a map. And I'm not sure what date this one is, but it, it shows um, the small, very small community of Lordsburg, so it was still before 1917. Small one of San Dimas, and then there's a little teeny weeny piece down here that's Covina, so it's a long time ago. Yeah. And there's Pomona uh -huh. and Claremont. Claremont, uh, Lordsburg, Laverne, San Dimas, Glendora, they were all started at the same time in 1887 along the railroad, the Santa Fe Railroad tracks. Uh -huh. And this, this uh, map here? Then this map was probably, I tried to figure that one out by what was advertised, and we haven't had it long enough for me to really discern what that is, but it's still pretty small, and it was called a Blackburn's map. But I have to look up and see what is advertised, and then go through the the uh, city directories to find out really when that was. Then this uh, goes back to the old Spanish and Mexican ranchos. It's really Mexican. You know, the ranchos, a lot of the people call them Spanish ranchos, but they were not um, divided up and, do and um, bequeathed, or whatever you want to call it, to people until after the Mexican um, Mexican, Spanish and Mexican War. Uh -huh. So it was in the 1840s. 40s or 40s? Or 40s, 1840. Well, 1837, along in there. Uh -huh. So this, um, here we are. Here we are, clear at the edge of the map. The um, San Jose, and then the addition to San Jose is right in here. Okay. It was called the uh, called San Jose, I think uh, that it was granted on St. Joseph's Day or something like that. Uh -huh, and this small and, one. And this one is, um, let's see, it shows particularly. Rancho our, San Jose. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting to note that our border, this is something I, I figured out myself, the border of, um, uh, it goes down what you call Badillo if you're uh, Italian and Badillo if you're Spanish on the way to Covina. Uh -huh. And uh, so that uh, outline, I measured according to the, 
to the um, chains and so on on the original map. Uh -huh. And this is just sort of a colorful map, Roads of Romance, and it gives a similar panorama of that area. Our gazebo is located just three blocks from the National Hot Rod Association's Pomona Raceway. And they just finished the World Championships uh, here just this last month. Uh, we talked to the uh, people at uh, the raceway about our concerns as a community as regards the noise levels uh, during those races, uh, one in the last part of October and the Winter Nationals in February. The officials for the raceway and for the National Hot Rod Association are making preparations to at least minimize the amount of noise uh, involved with the races. And we, we talked to Wayne McMurtry regarding their position on noise. Uh, well, a lot of activity here with uh, an NHRA uh, uh, going on in the Pomona Raceway. Uh, uh, what, what has happened here in the last year of significance to uh, the racing uh, industry and to the cities of Pomona and Laverne? Well, after uh, uh, what has really been a team effort, that term gets used a lot, but there's been a lot of effort by the uh, folks in both Laverne and Pomona and ourselves and the, and the Los Angeles County Fair Association in LA County. And uh, as a result of everyone's efforts, uh, we have uh, secured a 15-year lease, ex really an extension of existing lease for the use of Pomona Raceway here on the Fairplex grounds. And um, so with that in hand, that allowed us to do many of the permanent improvements that really need to be accomplished to uh, not only serve the needs of our clients, but also uh, uh, provide the theater in which the uh, sport of drag racing needs to be presented, as opposed to the uh, makeshift situations that have been utilized here for some 34 years. Yeah, now you take uh, the stands up and down. Will some of these be permanent stands now, or will they still go up and down? Uh, we were able, before this race, uh, able to complete about one-sixth of what our permanent stand uh, will be. When, when completed, Pomona Raceway will have the largest seating inventory of any drag strip in the United States, and larger than many of the other types of motorsports uh, uh, tracks. Uh, there'll be uh, approximately 34,000 permanent seats in one structure. It's wow. going to be very impressive. Uh, of that 34,000, something, and I don't know the exact number, around 20,000 will have backs. Uh, as a part of the overall program that's put together, and go back to an uh, opening comment about the cooperation we received from Laverne and, and various folks in the area, that we have adjusted over the years our racing schedule, uh, self-imposed some curfews, uh, eliminated some of the types of cars that uh, are somewhat offensive, and I just heard a helicopter fly <laughs> over. Um, so uh, those were really band-aids and allowed us to continue with uh, our efforts to finally realize what will be our permanent home here uh, when completed. The sound wall structure was designed by a firm, Gordon Bricken and Associates, uh, down in Anaheim, and utilizes uh, a type of block that was used by NASA in their uh, test cells for uh, testing of jet motors and things of that nature. Uh, I'm anxious to see how well it does work. We're satisfied that it'll work because we've seen examples of it before. There is, of course, only so much you can do with brick and mortar but all of the studies point to that we'll be able to achieve our goal of a 50% reduction in the acoustical energy. Uh, point out that a 50% reduction is only a 10 decibel because it's logarithmic, so uh, it's hard to achieve, and uh, certainly for this event, as you can see, the building isn't completed and we still have some voids in the wall, so I don't believe that you're going to be able to perceive much improvement at, at this venue, but certainly we will uh, be able to test the theory come February. Okay, what are your main events? And then how do you fit into the economy of the San Gabriel Valley? Okay, um, well, our, we have a series of 19 events that are the Winston, NHRA Winston World Championship Series events. The season starts and ends here every year. The opening uh, event is the long-standing traditional Winter Nationals the first weekend in February. 
and and the, this is the closing event. Our champions are determined at the, uh, the when this event is secured. And in between there, we sort of follow the sun across the uh, the United States and, and produce some 17 other events. Uh, as far as the economy is concerned, we're here in the Inland Valley. We're uh, just a huge uh, population center may not be as evident as it would be in some of the other locales uh, like Gainesville, Florida. Just recently produced a study that so we account to, for about $20 million annually in increased revenue for uh, Gainesville, Florida. Uh, Gainesville just so happens, those of you that are, you know, we're all football fans, I think, particularly collegiate fans, is the home of uh, the university, the Gators. And the same study that they produced said that NHRA, through the Gator Nationals event, produces more revenue in one weekend for the county and the city as all of the university's athletic program does in a year. We were quite pleased with that. As that relates to uh, our impact on the, in, on the Inland Empire here, it's going to be hard to find a motel room this weekend. And if you're going out to eat Saturday, I suggest you go a little early before the races are over. Uh, there isn't a hard number, but uh, it's, it's uh, you know, 30, 40 million dollars annually. They'd be comfortable with that statement on what we uh, bring to the economy of the Inland Valley. Our town is one of the safest towns in the San Gabriel Valley. Consistently, we have a safety record in the, the kinds of crimes that people are most concerned about. As a regular segment on our town, we're going to have a crime watch and in some cases, safety hints as regards uh, a crime here in our city. And Chuck Ochoa uh, from the Laverne Police Department will be giving us report weekly uh, that we're going to call, generally anyway, Crime Watch. Good evening. I'm Chuck Ochoa of the Laverne Police Department, and this is a segment of Crime Watch. Throughout the city, we have many crimes, and we keep a daily log of all these crimes. The reason for doing this is so everybody at the station knows what's going on and we have documentation of all the crimes that occurred within the city. Occasionally we're going to need some assistance in finding people that are committing these crimes. Currently we're having some problems with commercial burglaries down the south side of the city in the areas of Walnut, Arrow Highway, and First Street. The types of burglaries that are going on, they're stealing laser printers, telephones, and computers. With any luck here in the near future, we'll be catching these criminals, and we may need your help or ask for your help in doing so. The intent of this program is not only to be informative back and forth between you, the public, and us, but maybe even giving some crime prevention tips. Over the few weeks, or I'm sorry, over the weeks that we're going to be doing this, uh, we'll be giving you crime prevention tips on personal safety, rape prevention, uh, seasonal tips when it comes Christmas time and all, just to keep you abreast of what you should be thinking about. If everything goes well like we intend, this will be an ongoing show and will open up the communication between you and the police department. And that's what we need more of. So in the future, we will continue this with your support and we'd like to do so. This is Chuck Ochoa, Laverne Police Department. We've invited Steve Preston, the director of the community development here for our city, uh, to our porch to discuss planning here in our city. Steve Preston, welcome to our town. Hi, Bill. Good to be here. Steve, would you explain our city master plan? Absolutely, Bill. Every city in California is required to have some sort of plan to guide its growth and development. What is different about what Laverne has done is that we've developed a master plan, it's called a comprehensive general plan, that seeks to not only document the things that have made Laverne special in the past, but to find a way to project those 20 years into the future. And in order to carry that out, we chose a theme, which most cities don't do, we called the general plan Legacy and Prophecy. And the idea throughout the document was to portray those two parallel sets of issues. Those legacies that people in the past have left the citizens of Laverne today, and then the prophecy that guarantees that those legacies will continue into the future. And in developing that product, 
we did a lot of things that were unusual. One of them, for example, is that general plans, as they're written in California, are typically very technical documents. They're the sort of thing that only the author ever wants to read. But we chose to do something a little different. We spent two and a half years just in citizen participation up front. We got everybody's vision of what they would like Laverne to be like. And the great thing was that everybody said, we like Laverne to be the way it is. And we set out to find the strategies that would make that happen. We developed a cultural resource element to make sure that the city's wonderful collection of historic structures is preserved. There's a resource management chapter that ensures that the hillside areas that have been a source of, of real concern to the residents are protected well into the future. There's a community design element that says Laverne wants to be a city that sets uniformly high standards for the design, both of its private and its public projects. So uh, we think those are some of the things that really set Laverne apart. Steve, how would you describe the city of Laverne? Laverne is a charming college town. And um, probably most importantly, the thing that uh, sets Laverne apart for the new uh, business person coming into town is that most people consider it a special place, a place that has low crime, good schools, and a quality of life that is not generally associated with other spots in the L.A. Basin. How can we continue to balance the, the heritage of a small town in an atmosphere of new growth? Bill, there are probably three things all together. You take them as a unit, and those are the things that are going to propel us 20 years ahead, develop our business community, and protect the quality of life here. The first is implementing that general plan that we talked about. This is uh, a wonderful place to be because we have a city council that's committed to doing that. So that general plan is already being implemented. Ordinances being prepared, new capital improvements being built, new projects underway. The second element of the program is the city's strategic plan, uh, a document put together by our city management staff. Uh, it has won awards for the city. And what it does is say, it's great to have a physical blueprint for the community, but we also need a blueprint for the organization. And that blueprint should be strategic rather than broad and comprehensive. And it should say, as public servants working for the citizens of Laverne, this is the type of image we want to portray. We want to attract quality of life. We want to attract quality businesses. And we will develop the internal characteristics that will get us there. So when you open the strategic plan, which is part of the basic training of every city employee, it includes a sort of wheel of fortune, if you will. And each spoke on that wheel represents one of seven fundamental tenets that Laverne City staff believe they should communicate as part of the, the vision of the city. It's things like. Uh, um, a sort of team approach to problem solving, mm -hmm. uh, leadership, you know, citizen service. There are all sorts of things built into that strategy, and then those are in fact implemented through a series of uh, programs and, and action objectives. The third part of that three-pronged approach is an economic development action plan. It was adopted by the Redevelopment Agency about two years ago, and it sets four broad strategies to attract and retain business in Laverne. Some of those are things like direct financial types of incentives to attract, recruit, and then retain businesses in the city. Others are things like planning infrastructure to make sure that the services are there that are needed to supply these businesses. Uh, other approaches include things like marketing and promotions. All of these are spelled out in detail in the action plan, and we've already taken some big steps toward implementing the plan by finishing off projects like the first phase of coal. That's a hundred and, I want to say a hundred and sixty, hundred and three acre project.
us a new fire engine as well, right? Bought us a new fire engine, absolutely. And then we've got projects like the new... or retail opportunities where they see that uh, movie theater complex as a big attractor for people. Tell us about the murals here in our city and what they, from your perspective, add to our community. The murals are part of an evolving program in Laverne where we're saying that special communities have certain traits that they share in common with other special communities. One of those traits has traditionally been an interest in public art. Now, public art, as most cities have uh, used the term, means some very simple things. A statue in the park, uh, a grand civic center, uh, public buildings that present a, sor a certain aura or help project the image that that city would like to have of itself. Laverne's approach is a little different. Laverne has said public art isn't just what you plop down on a piece of land, but it should be part of the fabric of the community, the texture. As you walk down the street, you should be able to appreciate the elements of art that are within your, uh, within your vision each step of the way. If I look out from the porch of your house, if I walk uh, past the murals in the downtown, I can find three different examples where we've had people recreate images that relate to the city's past, to its heritage, and images that people want. Second mural relates to sort of the, uh, the growth and development of Laverne. It's located exact same street corner so that somebody can take a look at the corner as it was sort of the crowning together a lot of different topics to make something that would be interesting to drivers along Arrow Highway or users bits and pieces of what makes this community special. Steve, thank you for being with us today on Our Town. Thank you, Bill. Well, that's our show for today. Please join us again next week on Our Town.